Hey there, this is Jay Frost speaking to you from Command Central at the Philanthropy Mastermind Series. But it's the big news is that it is Giving Tuesday. So um, thank you for hanging out with us on uh, what is the kickoff to the giving season. It should be a big day. I know that we've seen kind of interesting numbers in terms of philanthropy in the last year uh, from the Giving USA results. So we're all probably on pins and needles wondering what this season will look like. Um, but if the consumption measure of Black Friday is any indication, we could see that people are in the mood to do more. And the real question is, do we know who they are and what it is that they're trying to do? And can we be a part of that if we truly understand their motivations and what helps them to be successful in their philanthropy? So these are all some of the things we'll be talking about today in the Philanthropy Mastermind series, courtesy of our friends, of course, at DonorSearch, who make all this possible and have been doing so since 2016. So that's a shout out to them. It's the only one you're going to hear probably today, unless our guest mentions them to you. Uh, but if you want to learn more about what they do, which of course helps us to focus on our donors, you can do that over at DonorSearch.net. And while you are there, you can see all there is to know about the Philanthropy Mastermind series as well under the resources tab. Um, and you can also visit our new social channels on your favorite uh, social network. So I hope you'll check out all of that after you're a part of this conversation here today. So I know Jack has been prompting you for that, and we're going to keep an eye on the chat and the Q&A throughout. So if you have anything to say or just want to make an observation or maybe even just say hello, I know that our guest would love to know where you're here from and maybe, you know, um, which organization you're with, something like that. So anybody who's willing to warm up the chat, we'd really, really welcome that. Um, and uh, same on the Q&A throughout. So with that, I want to, of course, welcome our guest today, who is Alex Johnston. And Alex is the, as you know already from the titles, uh, the president at Building Impact Partners, but he's also the author of a book, which was the inspiration for conversation and having it today, which is Money with Meaning, How to Create Joy and Impact Through Philanthropy, which is what I think we're all trying to do in this season, um, including uh, the folks in the chat. Joseph, thank you for saying hello. They're from uh, Greater Atlanta. And Bobby um, from Village Theater, thank you very much. Uh, Amy, hello there. Uh, Wow, uh, Infinite Family in South Africa. Thank you, Amy, tuning in from uh, far away. We really appreciate you uh, and everybody else who's here with us. So Alex, thanks so much for hanging out today. Really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for having me, Jay. It's really a pleasure to be with you on such a significant day in, in the field of philanthropy. So thank all of you who've tuned in today. Many of you are also raising money today or giving money away. Uh, there's a lot going on in the field and really appreciate the chance to be with you today. Yeah, I think we're all doing a little bit of both, right? Um, is hmm, You've been involved in this work for a long time. What is the significance, if any, of Giving Tuesday in particular to you, your way of thinking or maybe even just your giving? If yeah, you well, it's interesting. I mean, as a philanthropy advisor, a lot of our clients, you know, people who have the resources to hire a philanthropy advisor are many cases not organizing their lives around Giving Tuesday. But where it really does come into play is many times with grantees and partner organizations. We see some of our, our donors, our clients putting up matching funds because they're interested in creating uh, more opportunity for grantees to inspire others to give. And, um, you know, this question of co-investment or sort of getting money off the sidelines in philanthropy is one that I know so many of us um, really gravitate to. And it's a big reason why I wrote this book, because we are living in such a strange time where we've never seen such a concentration of wealth. You know, the wealthiest 100,000 Americans have $11 trillion in privately held wealth. But well, you, you mentioned the Giving USA report. If you match that against WealthX and some other um, sources of data, donor search can probably help with this too. What we see is that of those 100,000 wealthiest Americans, people who have 30 million or more in investable assets, only 85 billion of that 11 trillion is being given away as philanthropy each year. So it's three quarters of 1%. And there's so much opportunity for those individuals to give more deeply. And many of them have formed an explicit intention to do so. And yet still, um, we see just a fraction of one percentage of that total wealth actually getting out in the world as, as giving. Um, and you know, <laughs> that's something we all need to focus on. Um, and I'm, you know, that's a big reason why I wrote the book. Well, and, and I do want to ask you about that. Uh, but maybe, 
I want to ask you the bigger question first, the harder question, which is why? Why is there so much money on the sidelines? Why is only three quarters of 1% of that, of that wealth? Now, of course, we've got also everybody else in the country and in the world tuning yeah. in to giving today and all those donations and all those donors and all those volunteers and all those other things. Those are all very, very, very important. But for this small group of people who can make such a huge impact, why are they on the sidelines? Yeah. Well, I want to emphasize just the point you made before I answer that question of why these 100,000 folks are on the sidelines. When you look at the total giving in the US by individuals, it amounts to about 325 billion. So that 85 billion is actually just a fraction. It is actually regular folks who are doing most of the individual giving. And that's such an important point to make because Giving Tuesday really does matter. And when we look at the scale of philanthropy and individual giving overall, the majority of the money is coming from people who do not, who are not billionaires or even millionaires. Um, so let's remember that. Um, and at the same time, the capacity for more giving is massively disproportionately concentrated in this relatively small group of people who represent one thirty thousandth of the population. One in thirty thousand people is ultra high net worth in the United States, and and yet about a quarter of all giving is coming from this group of 100,000 people. And that's not even true because if you look inside that 100,000 people, a, a great majority of them are not deeply engaged philanthropically. And so we see really um, a handful of name brand, household name billionaires who are who are giving uh, at a very high level. And we've all followed Mackenzie Scott's uh, journey there. Um, there are others, Mike Bloomberg, you know, who, who routinely top that list of individual givers that Forbes publishes. So the the challenge that I think uh, comes up why why is it that um, there are so many folks who have a genuine positive intention to give um, and and aren't acting on it that's one issue to address there's another issue of like hey there is a bunch of people in that group of a hundred thousand who really aren't focused on philanthropy at all and I'm happy to talk about that as well but the the, the for many of us who are going to be in this conversation there's a lot to do with people who already have some kind of intention to be philanthropic, but aren't acting on that intention in line with their own values and, um, and beliefs. And I, you know, spent a dozen years in this field as an advisor. And before that running a nonprofit organization, raising money. And so I've been on a lot of different sides of, of this dynamic and my takeaway, you know, and I'm really curious, you know, what people would say in the chat or what your own experience has been. This is going to be maybe be a little bit counterintuitive or maybe even sound a little bit heretical. But I have actually come to believe that something we put in place in this sector to try to fix things has become part of the problem. And that is this idea of strategic philanthropy, that um, that what the, the holy grail for donors is to develop your own strategy, your own theory of change, your own metrics, your own milestones. And then hold yourself accountable for allocating your dollars at the margin to the most impactful thing that you possibly can. And the reason I say this is that certainly there are some big foundations out there that engage in giving in that fashion and have a big team to carry it out. And not all of them do it, <laughs> do it as well as, as you know, they could. And they would say that themselves. But there are, for every big foundation that is engaged in that kind of strategic philanthropy, there, in my experience, there are many, many, many individuals who do not want to gear up that way, don't think they have, they're not billionaires, they have maybe tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, but strategic philanthropy is not a fit for them. It's very resource intensive from a time perspective, a human capital perspective to do that well. And doing it well also requires real relationship and proximity with the people that you're engaging with. And, and so it's actually really hard to do strategic philanthropy in that conventional way. And, and what I believe has started to happen is that because we've celebrated in the field as the gold standard, there are a whole lot of donors who are actually holding back because in their heart of hearts, they don't find that fulfilling, but they feel like doing anything else would be less than rigorous. It would be irresponsible. They would be judged to be self-indulgent if they didn't kind of go forward in that way. And that's why the example of Mackenzie Scott has captured so many people's imagination, because she, you know, she didn't do what so many other billionaires have done. I mean, there is strategy behind what she's doing, but it is it is a very different approach. And that kind of approach is is very freeing. Um, and 
what I've come to believe is that many donors have, and this is going to sound strange, they have not focused enough on their own currency of fulfillment, their own psychology, what's actually meaningful to them, because they focus so much on maximizing impact. They've neglected the fact that philanthropy is fundamentally a voluntary activity. And if it is not something that is engaging and meaningful to them at a personal level, inevitably they're going to do less of it. And so philanthropy for many ultra high net worth individuals has come to resemble like a, a kitchen renovation project where you know they might get excited when they flip through the magazine or they talk to an architect, but they never get around to putting up the dust curtain because at the end of the day, it feels like a chore. And, and so it's strange to say that we would actually need to create more space for the humanity, the feelings of ultra high net worth people in a society where wealth is so concentrated and where many of us are just feeling like, for God's sake, can't we just get this money moving? But I, I really believe that, you know, the, the idea that we're going to shame people into giving more, we can see that's not working uh, when we just look at the numbers, uh, despite the fact that we've seen, you know, so many public critiques coming forth, we're not seeing a commensurate rise in individual giving. It's It went up a bit in the pandemic, but it it's not it's not going up in level with the critique. And the other idea that, you know, the main idea we have for fixing this is changing policy. But I guess I'd say, I'm, I think of myself just pragmatically, I look at what's going on in Washington and the prospect that we're gonna change the tax code or we're gonna change major regulations about distribution requirements for donor advised funds. I mean, those bills are literally stuck in Congress right now. And so that brings me back to psychology and why I wrote the book, because I, I think that the path forward here is really around more deeply engaging, understanding and um, creating space for donors to get more in touch with what's meaningful to them, as well as what's impactful, and then solve for that intersection of social impact and personal fulfillment. Well, one, one thing I will say is that there's a lot that's stuck in Washington, so we're, we're not unique in that, but, um, <laughs> but I, I, there's another thought that crossed my mind as you were talking, which is that we do have people from all over the country and, and several places around the world. In fact, I saw here, uh, Calvin's in, in Kenya. So appreciating uh, the diversity of, of voices and, and uh, experiences here in the room. Um, but the reason I mention that is because you talked about the concentration of wealth in the United States and its impact on philanthropy. And I know in a moment, we're going to talk about this, more about your book and the joy that people either do or could derive from their philanthropy. And I suppose a part of that will be their engagement with not-for-profit or other charitable uh, organizations. Um, but the reason I mention this is because that concentration of wealth is not unique to the United States either. That's right. right? So um, whether you're um, working uh, in, in, you know, uh, in, in, on the African continent or somewhere in Europe or in Asia, the issues uh, may be different in many respects. But this idea that there are a few people who can make transformational gifts is not. That is that is almost a global phenomenon. Um, and so when you've been talking about this, Alex, one of the, the thoughts that occurred to me is we, we should just dive into uh, a couple of things. One is why in the world did you write this book? I mean, what were you trying to solve personally, but also as a, as a business owner, a person who's been in the sector for a while, what's the problem that needs to be solved? Um, yeah, well, I appreciate that question. And um, for me, the the thing that just I feel most passionately about is as a philanthropy advisor, you know, we sit in between donors and extraordinary social entrepreneurs who are doing incredible work on the most pressing challenges that we're facing. And let's not kid ourselves in a world that is literally and figuratively on fire. The, the work of nonprofit or for-profit social entrepreneurs is pivotal and, and, what I feel, I mean, I just can't tell you how many calls I get from folks who are desperately trying to raise resources, social entrepreneurs who don't have the capital they need at every stage from seed to scale. So that's one side of, and by the way, like you can't hire us to raise money. We are entirely a funder facing firm, but I spend a lot of time with people who are raising money, um, often on behalf of donors who are trying to help them uh, raise more money. And so on the one hand, I'm getting all of this input from extraordinary social entrepreneurs. We run an accelerator program for social entrepreneurs called the Joyful Impact Accelerator because burnout is such a huge problem where, you know, so I, and I come from that world myself. So that's the one side of my experience. The other side of my experience is conversations with ultra high net worth individuals that go a little something like this. 
you know, maybe we're a couple in our mid forties, mid fifties. We've had a conversation with our kids. We have a couple hundred million dollars that we've decided to give away in our own lifetimes. And we've done the math. We know we need to like triple the rate of giving. Uh, we're already on the boards of, you know, our, our alma maters have come calling and anyone with a major gifts officer has like found us, you know, and using things like donor search, right? Like, like, you know, great tools that are out there to help people find ultra high net worth individuals. So a, a, a couple like this might come to our firm and say, we want to get more strategic. We, we want to do more with our giving. We want to gear up our giving. But then this kind of problem happens where they get excited in some initial conversations, but then they actually, it's not like they go work with some other advisor. They just don't actually end up leaning in. And I've, and I just can't tell you how many conversations, and I also run an accelerator program for philanthropy advisors. So I know across the field that many philanthropy advisors are having the same experience. They're having conversations with, with donors who have an intention and then do not take action on that intention. And meanwhile, and Alex, yeah. when, when you say that, does that mean that they stop, that they either they don't, don't stop start giving. giving or they stop they don't giving? Or they just... they, okay. so, so these are people who, you know, if you have a couple hundred million dollars, right. you've been found by lots of oh, folks sure. already. And you are, chances are, you might be giving away even millions of dollars a year, but you've decided to go to lean in. You've decided to gear up to do more. And we see the same phenomenon with billionaires who've signed the giving pledge you know, of the 62 who signed originally, maybe only 11 or 12 have actually spent down. The, the vast majority are actually wealthier now than they were when they signed over 10 years ago. And it's not because they haven't been giving money away. It's because their wealth has grown even faster. I mean, it's, it's, it's really striking. Um, so this problem exists for people, you know, who, who are multimillionaires to billionaires. And, and I've gotten really puzzled, like, what is going on here? So, hold that tension. And then I've been on my own journey of personal development and growth going back five, six years. I've delved just my version of a, of a midlife crisis, if you will. I just wanted to understand, like, I, I didn't feel like I was in full alignment. I wasn't finding that intersection of joy and impact. And it's not like anyone else would, from the outside would have looked at me and said, there's a problem there. But I had this sense that I could show up with sort of more positive presence in my family, in my friendships, in my professional life. And so I started this journey. I joined the entrepreneurs organization as a business owner. I um, delved deeply. You know, I've probably at this point read literally hundreds of books at this intersection of personal development, systems change, philanthropy. And I'm trained as a coach in multiple modalities because I found so such powerful transformative material that, I, you know, you can have as many advanced degrees. I don't care how educated you are. It's very easy. Um, Certainly in, in you know, uh, conventional American <laughs> education, and, and globally, I think this is true in some cultures, perhaps more than others, but you can go through life and not get the owner's manual for your brain uh, and, and your soul and like how it all works, right? And, right. And but, but often you've been driving that car for years before you figure that out. Just like you said, midlife crisis or whatever you don't want to yeah. describe it, then you find out you don't have the manual. Yeah. And you can be very, very high functioning. And this is the pattern of people in our Joyful Impact Accelerator. They're extraordinary social entrepreneurs. They've had extraordinary impact. But for many of them, it's actually coming, for me, certainly, from a fear-based place, from a performative place, from just this sense of scarcity. And so I went on this journey myself. And I, I just found like so many ahas of opening up to the idea of abundance in my life. And and evolution and flexibility in the way that I meet my needs so that I don't have to always do it like that. And so I brought that into my philanthropy advising practice. It's a little bit like finding religion. Some of the clients that I've worked with were like, hey, Alex, what's going on? Like, you seem like you're something good is going on for you. And so I started actually coaching some ultra high net worth folks that I was working with. And, and that unlocked for me the aha that, um, that actually, and this is now I'm going to get a little metaphysical here. But I really believe we've created a world that is so complex, so interconnected and complex that the way we have been wired evolutionarily over millions of years and in kind of a fight or flight brain is just not a match for the circumstances that we now face, that we're constantly being triggered into that fear-based fight or flight approach. And by the way, if you're an ultra high net worth individual, chances are you have 75% chance you made the money yourself. 
you started out from working or middle class origins. Most people don't realize this. Only 7% of those 100,000 people fully inherited that wealth. So by and large, the, the category of people we're talking about have been on this incredible journey of financial success and business success in their own lifetimes. And a lot of times they reach this point in their life when they're hoping that their philanthropy will help them make sense of where they are. They're immigrants to this land of wealth. There's a great book um, you know, that, that uses that, that metaphor um, of the immigration journey to understand the journey to wealth by Jim Grubman. And, and so my, where I'm coming from in all of this is this sort of sense that actually psychology and personal development is vital to donors developing a really meaningful sense of fulfillment from their giving. And that part of the reason folks end up hyper-focusing on impact and hanging back is actually out of fear on multiple levels. And that fear is actually often the dominant emotion in philanthropy, both for people who are raising money and for people who are giving it away. And Fear, that, fear of what? <laughs> fear of everything, fear of not being enough, fear of not being loved, fear of being misunderstood, fear of wasting your money, fear of being valued only for your money. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the list just goes on and on. We are fundamentally wired as fear-based beings. It's it's fundamental to how we have survived. Um, but we're now in a place where we've created problems that can't be solved at that level of consciousness. We're not going to solve climate change out of fear. I mean, we already see, right? We, we have to rise. And so there's a lot of work to do. And the reason I wrote the book was really sort of trying to uh, elevate the idea for donors and those who work with them, that there's an inner journey of giving that is just as important, if not even more important than the external journey. And that we often focus just on allocating our resources and trying to do the most good that we can. And we're missing the, the internal growth and the relationships that will actually give us that sense of being fully human um, through our giving. Um, there, there are so many things I'd like to ask you about in that. And one of them has to, it has to do with something you said earlier, you were talking about, um, I can't quote you now, I apologize, but it, kind of the public perception and, or misperception about, uh, people with wealth, um, it, almost turning them into, you know, one dimensional figures that we either adore because they gave us something or we 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 abhor them because we think they have something that really belongs to the community. I mean, it, it goes many fashions and there are many different degrees of scale, but there is this love-hate relationship with wealth for, for a lot of people. And maybe part of that is centered in fear, fear about what we individually either need to do in order to put a meal on the table or how to protect the assets we've accumulated. But all this then is reflected in our relationships with potential donors. And you just kind of humanize this a bit by going through this list of all these fears that anybody who has accumulated a little bit of something might have. Um, what I'm still wondering about is how we could potentially help with that in our world. So if many of the people in the room here, um, and let me know, everybody in the chat, if I'm wrong about this, uh, will be folks who are working at not-for-profit organizations or charitable organizations of one form or another, and you're probably seeking support for your cause. There are also people out there that haven't given you that support yet. You're probably trying to find out where to where to get that support. And one of the questions then is, well, how do we really understand the people who might have these resources? Not just what are the magic words we need to say so they'll give us a gift on Giving Tuesday, but really how to understand where their heart is so we can help them on that journey. Can you talk about this a bit in the light of like the people in the room, the people in this audience, how we can help those donors to make that journey? Yeah, this is such an important topic, and it's actually one that that um, I've explored through a, a webinar series called Fully Human Fundraising, um, because, again, I feel so many calls from um, nonprofit leaders who are experiencing phenomenon like disappearing donors, like you thought this person was going to renew or this foundation, and then pff, they're gone, or um, just the, the sense that um, you don't really know why your biggest supporters are actually supporting you. Um, you know, you're feeling like, you know, you love every part of your job as a nonprofit leader, except the fundraising. And you're really worried that you're going to be letting your team down, letting the, the folks that you're doing the work down. And so there, there are a lot of um, 
negative experiences and associations that we have as, as social entrepreneurs around fundraising. And I want to say, I inhabit this role myself because one of the ways we resource our accelerator programs is by raising sponsorship dollars. So yes, we advise donors and we help them give money away, but we also, um, managing the, this sort of different conflicts of interest, we raise money from those same folks in order to serve philanthropy advisors right. and uh, nonprofit entrepreneurs. So I am right there with you around those challenges of fundraising. And I think that one of the biggest challenges is that there is an industry norm in fundraising that has that we have been taught. Um, think about the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you know, which is, is originally a play, you know, all about sales, always be closing. Coffee is for closers. ABC. I know when I was a nonprofit leader, you know, I I felt the pressure to make an ask. And that I had to have a big funnel and I had to work people through that funnel. And, you know, if I just, yes, lives in the land of no, all these aphorisms that we've internalized about just get out there, pound the pavement, and somehow the resources you need will come out the bottom of that funnel. Well, listen, there is something, if you are running a nonprofit that is basically in making widgets, in effect, something that can be measured and um, and you really are competing on the basis of your cost per service unit, then it might make sense for you to engage in that way. But many of us who are doing this work are engaged in complex social issues where story and narrative and proximity is vital to understand, to actually understanding the impact that we're having. And what that means is that that high pressure sales tactic model just doesn't work. And it's not relational. It's actually getting in the way of connection and understanding and creating the space for donors to actually talk about what they really value. Because the premise that you have when you're engaging a donor in that sales model is that the only thing they care about is impact. And you need to sell them that your impact is the best, you know, that, that you are positioned for the, in this unique way. And if we look at the 10 largest gifts that were made to anywhere in 2022, half of them were raised through a totally different fundraising model. And we don't talk about this enough. What do major gift officers do? They do not make the mistake that impact is the only thing that donors care about. They see those donors as full human beings. And even when what those donors want is naming rights and like stuff that some of us might feel is a little bit icky, those major gift officers understand the psychology. They're seeking to understand what's important to that donor and not to pretend that the only thing they care about is impact. But so often we as nonprofit leaders approach donors as if they're these unidimensional impact maximizing robots. And that is just not how, especially individual unstaffed donors who aren't engaged in strategic philanthropy, that's not how they operate. As you talked about that, it, it strikes me that uh, the description of those major gift officers fits very nicely in the United States with the university model, where it's resourced, uh, where there's a staff that have different responsibilities and they work when they work well, they work well together. Um, and they are following a, a vision for what they want to achieve. And then they have a body of people that they can talk to who have some relationship to that vision. They've been through the school. They've had a, a child go through the school. They've gone through an executive education program. So they have some investment in the success of this thing, which hopefully they feel benefited them as well. So in each of those cases, then if they can talk to people and meet them where they are and build that relationship, I can see how that can work quite well. It, but obviously, uh, when you're talking about this donor universe that you've been working in, um, where you have high net worth individuals, especially in the US, but around the world, and they don't, and it's a non university environment, maybe even non a house, a hospital environment, yeah. but something else. We, are there, are the, do, is there a way to build that relationship to identify those people and build yes. that relationship in a way that's meaningful for the donor? Yeah, I, I believe so. And listen, I, I would also be the first to say um, that. You as a nonprofit leader, you know your experience better than me or anyone else. And so if anything I'm about to share is helpful to you, that's great. If what you're already doing is working, then stick with it. Um, because what I'm sharing is it sort of goes against the grain to some degree. But I've really come to believe in, in a framework that really talks about four R's, the four R's of fully human fundraising. 
The first is relevance. Relevance to the donor based on what they care about and usually beyond simply impact. And as you pointed out, Jay, in the context of a major gifts officer at a university, maybe the relevance box seems to be checked initially because they're approaching someone who's an alum of the university. But you know what? At a deeper level, not really. I mean, for, for most people, I mean, some people have this like deep allegiance to the to, but for a lot of people, that's not really going to make it relevant. There's going to be some other human factor that that is much more relevant to them. And so really understanding inhabiting the experience of, of the other person. And I'm going to give you, um, uh, if there's one thing to try, I will tell you what that is in just a moment. So relevance first, you've got to understand what those interests are, what the, the sort of human psychology is of the person you're engaging. The second is relationships, of course, right? And, you know, this is going to sound like pie in the sky. As, even as I'm talking about this, you're going to tell, well, I don't have these people in my network. I don't have a relationship. Hold on. The third is referrals. When you can get connected to someone by someone else they trust, um, you know that is a huge uh, accelerant. And the last is reputation, which I think we don't pay enough attention to. And this is really where, because you are putting value out into the world, people start to hear about that indirectly and they start to contact you. Um, and this is really important um, for many of us who are chief cook and bottle washer of a nonprofit. You don't have the time you, even if you were trying to work that funnel system, you couldn't possibly contact enough people to find the few that are going to be your major donors. And so finding ways to get out there and, and kind of push the content out that explains your story so that people who resonate with that and for whom it is relevant can find you and connect is, is really valuable. And so the if there's one practice to consider here, it's what I would call powerful conversations, a powerful conversations campaign is really around identifying a universe of individuals who you would ideally, who, for whom you believe your solution, your work is relevant. And they may not know it yet, but you identify that, that universe. And you know what? If you don't even know who's in that universe, then you simply start with people that you think um, may be connecting to those folks, even if you don't know their names. And in a powerful conversation, the premise of it is, I'm not here to ask you for something. I'm here to share, actually, really, I'm here first to ask you a question. If we were talking a year from now and things had just gone extraordinarily well in your world, you might narrow it and say in your giving, but what would you be excited to tell me about? And second, what's the single biggest challenge that's standing between you and that extraordinary vision? And so I'm now having this conversation with someone and I'm I'm hearing what they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. It's the... And you might think people wouldn't answer that question. People, in my experience, and I'm a 51-year-old white man, so it could be that I am, when I ask this question, I get a different response than others might. But I have done this training with lots of people in lots of different backgrounds, and this conversation like really gets started. And then you share your answers to that same, those same two questions, and you look around each other's worlds for ways that you can help each other. That, I mean, <laughs> maybe this sounds like pie in the sky, I'm telling you, in my experience, this is what the most successful fundraisers in the field are doing. They're doing some version of this, and they're just challenging themselves, how many of these powerful conversations can I have? And from that, in a non-transactional way, and you know, there's a great book called The Generosity Network. There, you know, This is not a new idea, um, but the reason that we're not doing it more is a lot of the mental furniture that we have around our own psychology of raising resources, and also our psychology about who the wealthy are and how different they are from the rest of us. And so remember, 75% of these folks who have, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars started out working or middle class in their own lifetime. Right. I, I, um, it also strikes me, speaking of relevance, uh, which is the first of the four R's, that this is also relevant to everybody you know, who might be making an, uh, a contribution or expressing an interest in our organizations or our missions today. So one of the questions we always have is what's next after Giving Tuesday, which is a pretty damn good question. Uh, but one of the things is these powerful conversations because uh, we don't, it, beyond the digital receipt and beyond doing a screening, both of which can be important, um, we also wanna know where these people are coming from. And you just spoke to that. So uh, it's a matter of defining that universe and then sitting down with people. And when you just talked about this and asking those open questions, there's another word you didn't use that I see a lot come up a lot in both sales and in fundraising, 
And that's, you didn't say you're pitching anything. No, no. And I think pitching is a big part of the problem because we get so focused on delivering our pitch that we are not even listening. We, we couldn't even remember what anyone else said in that conversation. And the idea that our pitch is what's going to take us over the finish line, that we're going to persuade people with our pitch. It's just, it's not how, how we actually, how the world works in my experience. There are a few fields in which pitching is a thing, like um, private equity, venture capital, where the reason it, the reason it's so important there, and I, don't, I think people don't understand this, uh, you know, is that, you know, I'm an angel investor myself. The, the best practice for angel investors is to look at 40 deals and, and pick one. And so they want a five minute pitch, even less than that. Like they want it all compressed down. And then, because that's the initial sorting mechanism, but ultimately if you as an angel investor or VC are going to actually make an investment, you're going to get much more deeply engaged in a real conversation. And so we completely have misunderstood, in my view, what that pitch in that unique field is. And you get people who are training these five-minute pitches, and it's a complete misapplication of, in my view, and in a lot of cases, it's just the wrong tool in, in um, to advance uh, your development goals. Right, right. Well, and and I want to make sure that we have the door open for people who may have a different experience. So if you for sure. are here in the room with us and any of these concepts are ones you take issue with or if you have questions about any of this, I hope you'll you'll post them here. We are paying attention. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I, I did want to ask you about in this is uh, where this fits for you personally, if you don't mind my asking it. We didn't preview any of these questions. So yeah. one of the one of the things is you just described how you know, you came to this point in your life where you said, well, what does this really mean? And so you you thought about it, you explored it, um, you explored it as a business, but as a person, and then you wrote this book. I, uh, But I'm curious what it meant to you also as a donor. So how it maybe has changed your relationship with the organizations either to you were interested in before or the way you responded when people were seeking some level of support or engagement from you. How has it changed your life as a donor? Thinking about well, this. I really appreciate that question. And it's definitely fair to say that I'm eating my own cooking here. Uh, <laughs> meaning that um, I have just intuitively and ended up following some of the methods that I describe in the book. Um, for example, the book talks about six alternatives to strategic philanthropy. Um, and one of them is called Seed and Speed. Uh, which is really investing in early stage entrepreneurs, not just in their venture, mm -hmm. uh, but in them as human beings. Because when you do that, you know, as a donor with 100% certainty that you are having an impact, even if that venture doesn't go on to succeed, um, that your philanthropy, or even if you're making a, uh, a market rate, you know, angel investment or something that with a social purpose, because you were willing to look at them as a human being. And like, we have this accelerator program. So the participants of that accelerator program are in some cases, I mean, I, if I had the budget, I would give to all of them, but I have these personal connections, relationships. I've coached a bunch of them. And so I'm, I'm connected to many of the recipients in a small way, relatively speaking. Like, I mean, I'm not giving millions of dollars away, right? But um, giving thousands of dollars away, I have such certainty about the impact of what I'm doing. I only wish I could do more. Um, because of that connection to, and so that's an example for me. And, and like at this time of year, particularly on Giving Tuesday, I have an embarrassment of opportunities across the people that I've gotten to know as social entrepreneurs who I, I know at the, at the margin, like if I can give them a thousand dollars, like it would be extraordinary, like what they will do with it is really extraordinary. But that's one of six. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. Dude, yeah. don't hold, don't so, leave us hanging. Can you take us at least yeah, <laughs> briefly yeah. through the other five? <laughs> yeah, so uh, wings with no strengths. Is, that's Mackenzie Scott's strategy, right. where you find someone who's already flying high or poised for takeoff, and you just give them lift. Trust-based philanthropy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I, what I think there's some nuance around trust-based philanthropy and what she's doing. Like, what she's doing is not the only thing we need to think about and hold up. There are challenges and, and other unexpected consequences of some of what she's done. But I, I celebrate her for demonstrating like you do not need to create all of these reporting conditions, any of that. You can just give the money and let people go do what they will do with it and not even tell you about it. I mean, I mean, there's minimal reporting um, with her, but 
so th that one I think can be tremendously fulfilling and easy to implement um, and often gets overlooked. Um, there is equip for the trip, which is like expeditionary giving. So let's say we are at the forefront of human knowledge. Nobody knows how to cure a certain disease or a lot of times in advocacy, how to enact a certain policy. So what I as a donor would do is find someone who's on the forefront, who, who and, I, and I basically, this is another form of trust-based philanthropy. I'm trusting that they are gonna communicate to me what they need as they discover the path forward. And it's gonna be deeply rewarding for me as a donor because we're discovering something. This is exciting and it's, it's cutting edge. Um, and I'm willing to like go with it and sometimes to lean in, to do more. I love this for myself personally, because there are times when I can know that um, $5,000 could be transformational for somebody who's like developing. Um, there's a, a woman, uh, Jacqueline Davis, who's got a game called Clever Noodle. That's um, a play-based, evidence-based reading for kids. And it's phenomenal. And to watch her develop this, with her own son during the pandemic and then get on good morning America. Like she's now like, this is so exciting to me. And, and like, I've been, you know, not that I can take any credit for what she's doing, but like the ability to support someone like her along her journey is so meaningful. And she's discovering what to do as she's doing it. Right. Um, there's maintain and sustain. We overlook this one so much. Like there could be extraordinary institutions like the Harlem children's zone that are not growing anymore, but simply need ongoing support. And when you, again, pair up with a leader and support them year after year after year, and they can count on you, that's, you can, as a donor, you can take that to the bank. You know, you're making an extraordinary difference. Um, you know, there's one and done. Like, you know what? I don't want to make the decisions in my giving. I'm like, you know, a Warren Buffett. I'm just going to say, hey, how about the Gates Foundation takes care of this? Um, so, Outsource without remorse, that's a, a less extreme version of that. Like, you know, let's put my money in a pooled fund. I don't need to make those decisions. I don't have to hang my fulfillment on making the allocation decision. And, and I think that's just a simple psychological shift. It's hard for some people to make, but that is one of the biggest stumbling blocks that donors have is this idea that um, I must make the decisions in order for my giving to have impact and have meaning for me. And in reality, if you don't have the time and you don't have the proximity, it can be an extraordinary thing to just say to somebody else, to find someone else and say, you know what, I, here's some money, you go make it happen. And there's a, an example we use in the book, I would, I think this will happen in the next five to 10 years, that we'll see um, some rising gen uh, folks who are inheriting billions. We're going to see at least one person put together something like a MacArthur Prize on steroids, where they're saying, I'm going to create maybe five LLCs and I'll put one and a half billion dollars in each of them. And I'm going to literally give it to somebody. No strings attached. They're going to pay taxes. They're going to end up, I'm going to create a new billionaire and it's their personal money. And, you know, what would um, Jeffrey Canada do if somebody gave him, you know, a billion dollars that was his personal money? I would love to find out. Um, and and that's, an, that's another, like that's an extreme example, but I, I just think um, we're barely scratching the surface of some of these exciting alternatives to conventional strategic philanthropy. As you talked about that, a few of the examples you used, obviously, if not all of them, uh, except for Jeffrey Cannon and Harlem Children's Zone, were uh, LLCs or, um, you know, uh, other kinds of entities that are uh, quasi uh, business entities. In other words, the, the shareholders do have control in a way that the board members of a 501c3 in the United States um, have stewardship rights, but they do not own the entity and they do not derive any personal benefit in theory. So I'm, I'm wondering if you see uh, also, as you've been going through this process and working with, with donors, with business owners, entrepreneurs, and with not-for-profits, um, if you see uh, kind of a merging or melding um, of these uh, for-profit, not-for-profit models here and elsewhere, and is there a, a both a risk and a reward in that uh, merger, uh, real or otherwise? Yeah, that's such, such a great question. And there's actually a whole chapter in the book on structural forms because, you know, donors and philanthropy advisors often 
feel like one of the key questions they've got to address right at the bat is, you know, are we creating a private family foundation, a non-operating or operating foundation, an LLC, a DAF, you know, and um, and a lot of times those decisions are made by tax advisors before philanthropy advisors ever get involved. And so sometimes um, donors are grappling with a structure they built without with for tax optimization, not for um, sort of doing philanthropy that would be deeply meaningful to them. And so I would say that for some of the most sophisticated donors, we are seeing people deploy a whole array of structures in their giving. And I would also say that um, there, you can also be a pure checkbook philanthropist with no structure whatsoever. And, um, and the level of meaning that you derive from your giving is independent of the structure that you have put in place. And so I think we, we often put so much weight on the structural questions. Um, there's a massive chart in the book. It's actually too big to print in the book, so you can download it for free. Um, I should also mention that there's a whole, uh, companion, uh, at the book's website, you can get an access to videos and worksheets all for free. You don't have to buy the book to get this stuff. So if anything I'm talking about here is of interest to you, I'm mean, happy if you buy a book, but you can just go go to the website. And uh, So let, let's hit pause for a moment on that and just let people know where they can find out more about the book and we can have that put in the chat. So if people want to reach out to you or they want to see the book, where can they, where can they do that? Alex? Yeah. So the, the book you can find at meaningfulgiving.co.co. Um, the name of the book is Money with Meaning, How to Create Joy and Impact Through Philanthropy. And um, and you can contact me. Uh, you can email me uh, directly, uh, alex.johnston at buildingimpact.co.co. Okay. And Jack, I don't know if you caught those and we can put them in the chat. Um, and uh, But it's always good to read them out for those who are getting the, the advantage of the recording. And those other materials are there. And it sounds like, um, is it too big of a leap to suggest that if someone is not currently a major donor of some of one form or another, however one defines that, that um, that this material would be beneficial to them even for understanding donors? If they understand what the donor journey is like or the kinds of things you're suggesting people interrogate about the role that philanthropy plays in their life um, or meaningful investment does, that it would be beneficial for people on the fund development side as well. Yeah, I mean, I do think that um, I believe that to sort of we really need to shift this whole field and that it is going to take rising <laughs> personal growth uh, and deeper relationships for donors, philanthropy advisors and social entrepreneurs. And that we I, I, I'm a big proponent of a, of a movement for more meaningful giving giving that's at that intersection of social impact and um, personal fulfillment and, mm -hmm. and joy even. Um, and not just joy for the donor, but joy for everybody uh, involved um, that, you know, there's work here for all of us. Um, I, I do see there's a question in the, uh, in the Q&A here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and you and, well, I'll read it aloud if you don't mind, just sure. so, so that others can, can take advantage of it. Um, I've spoken about the importance of developing relationships. This is from an anonymous attendee. What advice would you give to a person who presents university alumni leads to fundraisers and they reject your leads because the alumni have never been engaged? So if I'm understanding that question right, um, the fundraisers are saying, well, you know, that doesn't seem like a, a worthwhile lead to me because this is not somebody who has a history of giving or who's kind of previously been, been in, our, in our world. And um, look, again, I would say, in every case here, I I am reluctant to give advice because you know your own experience and context way better than than I ever could. But I will simply give an experience share here, which is to say that when I have engaged in powerful conversations, it has been shocking to me sometimes how unexpected a turn such a conversation may take. Meaning that somebody, um, for example, someone who might contact me uh, seeking help or assistance in some way, and I have a conversation with them. And then it turns out that they have some relationship or something in their world that was exactly the thing that was like the missing piece of something I'm trying to build uh, or, or it sort of creates value or, or connection in some deeply unexpected way. And so I guess my, my fundamental idea is just to be open to the idea of serendipity and um, an unexpected connection. And that 
when we are in that transactional mode in the funnel, we're trying to qualify prospects and we don't want to waste our time on people who don't seem like they um, they qualify. And and I get that. And, and it may be that you need to keep doing that from a sort of, or some of the people that who are responding that way to your leads are thinking they have to continue that. But my challenge to you would be like, you know what, if you feel like you got to keep the lights on by conventional fundraising, the way you've been doing it, then keep doing that but at least open up a little space where you can start experimenting with these powerful conversations. Because I'm telling you, a single one of these can be transformation. Getting back to Jeffrey Canada, right? His board chair, you know, Stanley Druckenmiller was a college classmate of his and they never met when they were in college. And they happened to connect in Manhattan years later. And that turned into a deep, deep lifelong friendship. And probably Stanley has given well over a hundred million dollars um, to the Harlem Children's Zone over that time period. So a single conversation, uh, you never know, can can lead in a deeply unexpected direction. Um, and thank you, Loretta, for that comment about storytelling versus pitching. Um, and I might add that uh, in a way, maybe what you're describing, I always think it was, it's not a very elegant word, but story listening, because in those cases, you're you're really opening the door for a conversation with open questions, not with this specific purpose in mind, and I know that makes it difficult for our organizations. If, if we're working somewhere, and as you just said, Alex, we've got to raise so much money by the end of the quarter, by the end of the year, or else we cannot perform the mission. That's understandable. But if we don't take a little bit of our time, you know, I, I'm going to make up a percentage, 10% of our time to having these open conversations with people who have resources and passion for life to see if there's a marriage of, of mission, then would, how would we ever know? How would the how would Jeffrey and, and Stanley ever have come together if they hadn't had that conversation? And I hear that day after day after day. And I also hear on the reverse end, which I wanna ask you about as we get into closing minutes. I know it's not necessarily the focus of your book or your work, but I'm sure it's integral to it, which is how we treat people after we have these connections. So, um, and I had a conversation just earlier today, someone who's been in this series will be again next year, presented more than almost anybody else in the world on fundraising, very, very adept, knows this stuff very well and been very successful. And even in their case said that um, they, will send, they will make a gift and what do they get in response? A digital receipt and not being uh, called, written a note, texted or anything after a gift at the end of the year. And they serve on the board of one of these organizations that doesn't do it. And and I and I I'll stack up at the end of every year, my 15 or 20 end of year gifts, including the organizations that are in my will. And maybe I get two letters in print with a little postscript. Yeah. What is wrong here? And yeah. am I right that right. that's wrong? Or what do we do? Yeah. So Jay, I, I, relationships? I mean, I hear where you're coming from. And, you know, um, I definitely understand sometimes when donors feel like maybe they feel like they're being taken for granted. But I spend so much time with social entrepreneurs and people who are raising resources who are at their absolute limit. They're so burnt out and overwhelmed. And I, I have come to believe that that does that if there's a lack of follow through, it does not come from a place of not caring. It comes from the fact that the people doing the work look at fundraising as a necessary evil and they want to spend as little time on it as possible. And once your gift is in, they've moved on to get back to doing the work from their perspective. And, and so the, 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 the mindset that I try to inhabit as a donor is I do I don't expect an acknowledgement. I mean, maybe for tax purposes, I need one, but like, I, and if I'm already in relationship with one, it's just intrinsic in our relationship. It's like, I don't need the acknowledgement to feel acknowledged um, because I can make that feeling myself. I can take responsibility for my own feelings. I don't need anyone else to take action to create that feeling in me. And that to me is like the work I do every day, meditation, journaling, all the stuff I do to build up my own mindset so that I can show up in the space and be and take that stance. And, and that's really what I'm, I'm sort of, well, I'm on a mission around is like we all, I have that work to do. And, and you know, it's a constant uh, struggle. And yes, I mean, for sure, like, should we write acknowledgements? And yeah, like, that's all good stuff to do. But um, to me, uh, I think if we really engage with each other as full human beings, um, there are many ways we can feel acknowledged. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Treating each other as humans doesn't always take the form of a printed letter. Um, but it's, but I guess to your point, it's knowing what we want what what moves us, what motivates us, and what makes us feel whole, 
and then the organization acknowledging that and interacting with it in that way that's appropriate. Um, that's that's very helpful. Um, and thank you, Bobby, for that comment. Uh, and Cassandra, really do appreciate these things. Um, and Richard, uh, very nice to see you here, Richard. Um, it, it, as we kind of close this out today, Alex, I know there's, again, uh, many opportunities for things we could discuss, but do you have any kind of parting thoughts as we head into the season about um, maybe for us as donors? So the people in this room may be not uh, giving away millions. Uh, they may not even be giving away thousands, but I think everybody in our sector is a giver in some form. Um, what is it that we could take away from this so we can feel whole and and come into the new year uh, refreshed and feeling more aligned with our values as donors? Well, I so appreciate that question. And I think for me, it's really just giving ourselves permission to show up as donors, as, as human beings. And the reality is most of us who aren't giving away millions already, we, we may be checkbook philanthropists, but we follow our relationships, our passions, what strikes us in the moment. And while that might not seem strategic, um, the gifts we are making are meaningful. And remember, they add up to three quarters of all that individual giving that's out there. And so keep leaning in because we all uh, can give more and it's not just money. There are so many ways in which your other forms of capital, social capital, cultural capital, political capital, you can put it all uh, out there. And you know, I just encourage all of you to be field leaders in your own space because we've got to change this field together. Thank you so much for all, for all this, Alex. Really do appreciate it. And uh, you're being able to digest so much that you've learned and then been teaching into, uh, into the space of less than an hour. Um, I'm grateful for it. And I know everybody else here in the room is as well. I want to encourage people to take a look at those links that are in the chat so you can learn more about his work. Maybe go out and grab that book. We would appreciate that too. I'm sure you will. And if for insights into the donor journey, uh, and uh, even if you're not a donor, but hopefully it'll inspire that as well. And I also want to um, encourage you to be part of the series as we head through this season into the next one. And you can do that by letting us know what you want to see in here, which you'll see in the survey as we close out. Um, and if you want to know more about, of course, uh, the work of Donor Search, which has been referenced a couple of times. So thank you, Alex. You're welcome to do that by simply clicking on that little QR code you'll see at the end here. And it's also an invitation for you to be a part of the fabric of what we program for next year. We plan to have a lot of programming, and we want that all built around your needs and interests. Please let us know what you want to see in here. You can do that by contacting me directly at j, that's jay, at donorsearch.net. Um, we'll look forward to those comments. And in the meantime, enjoy Giving Tuesday. And I know we have a lot more insight into it, thanks to Alex. So thank you, Alex. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you all soon. Take care.